Welcome to today's masterclass. My name is Jose Rivera and I am the CEO of CSA and I will be your host today. For those who are unfamiliar with CSA, we are a global nonprofit trade association with over 500 members, member companies in 35 countries. To highlight just a few of our member benefits, we have the CSIA Best Practices Manual, which guides control system integration companies in the setup and running of a solid company. Any system integration company will benefit from the best practices, by, but earning the CSIA certification is a confirmation by a third party that you have deployed them correctly. For partner members, the CSIA offers an ecosystem to grow their system integration program, understand their customers' pain points, monitor industry trends, and share their thought leadership. A trusted resource of qualified integrators and suppliers, the CSA Industrial Automation Exchange helps system integrators, industry suppliers, and manufacturers connect and do business. For system integrators and partners, it provides a platform to support your content and SEO marketing efforts, position your company and C-suites at thought leaders and nurture prospects by providing a credible source for information about your company and its products. Finally, a reminder that in 2021, we have increased access to knowledge sharing, community building and networking through the year when you join or renew your CSIA membership. CSIA is committed to delivering extremely relevant content to ecosystem, to system integrators while providing partner members access to highly engaged audience. To that end, CSIA has been delivering virtual events on a broad range of topics and experiences, all of which have been open to sponsorship. For more information about CSIA, membership, virtual events, and sponsorship and advertising opportunities, contact us at info at staff.controlsys.org. At this time, I would like to introduce Chad, Allen, and Harrison. Gentlemen. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Chad Schaefer, I'm with Siemens Digital Enterprise team. Alan, do you wanna introduce yourself and then- Hi, good, good morning. Alan Simon, I'm CEO of North America Close Shoring. Good morning, I'm Harrison Wazard with Siemens USA Government Affairs. I'm just in the process of sharing my screen, bear with me. Okay, well, I'll kick off the discussion from the three of us as speakers. Again, I'm with Siemens Digital Enterprise team. And today I'm gonna to focus on uh, localization and a lot of what we're seeing around us, at least in the domestic market and the role that digitalization and digital may play as, as things change. And um, for sure, I think we've all lived through the fact that supply chains are very disrupted. Um, it offered some real positive things as we went through COVID and it, and it also offered some challenges. For example, our, our family is much better at, uh, at DoorDash and having things delivered and we've become more comfortable with supply chain to our home as we've worked with from home as uh, students and as professionals. Uh, but then it's also posed some challenges in that if I needed to replace uh, the inner tube for my daughter's uh, bicycle, well, I might have to wait because supply chains have been disrupted in a significant way. So I think it's affected all of us from a, a personal productivity standpoint. And certainly we've seen it unfold in our professional lives as we contribute to our respective organizations. But uh, in a post COVID environment, there's really an explosion of, of complexity on the digital front, and, and that does play a role in localization. Um, if I were to lean in specifically on the list you see there, I think in the US, for example, there's a lot of brownfield or existing manufacturing environments. And how do you take some of those and scale them up to be more productive in a digital way and to take advantage of some of the, the demands that are on localization for some companies and some industries and some verticals? And it's rare maybe that you would have the greenfield opportunity to start with a blank sheet of paper. But there's a lot of risk. And, and I personally feel uh, the community of uh, solution providers and integrators 
they are the unsung heroes of closing those gaps and implementing solutions for all sorts of vertical manufacturing markets. And uh, one thing certainly is, is put in front of integrators across at least the US market, and that is how and where should we get started? Um, not just with localization, but also utilizing a lot of these digital capabilities and these tool sets that can really enable, let's say maybe US manufacturing, but manufacturing globally as well. So there's just as many opportunities as there are challenges, just like there are in our personal lives, right? As we've gone through a COVID and a post COVID supply chain challenge. So um, one thing that at Siemens we've, we've tried to reflect on is there's a lot of global trends and how can we utilize those uh, to really unleash a lot of value and what we have found in our own facilities and, and we are a manufacturer, we've got somewhere in the range of 170 to 180 manufacturing environments that serve many different industries from automotive to process industries. Um, certainly we've seen a lot of activity in the pharma environment. Additive has been an exciting thing and safer buildings. All, all of those elements are a part of manufacturing and let's say the professional environment of, of tomorrow. And so uh, we have felt that if we can take the digital world and we can create simulations and we can practice in that vir virtual environment, it helps very much before getting into that physical world. And if we've got those brownfield spaces or greenfield spaces in our own manufacturing uh, environment, how do we use these tool sets um, to compete in a post-COVID environment? So, so we're seeing that pressure and trying to apply these tools in our own factories, which is what I'm sharing today. So something that Siemens went through back in 2010 uh, in, in all countries around the world, not just the localization movement that you might see in the US market, um, we were really challenged. Um, we really needed to try and produce in some higher cost uh, countries. We wanted to make sure we enabled some of the wonderful employees that we have. We wanted to arm them with a lot of industry 4.0 capability so they can enjoy their job and be more productive. And so that goal was really, how do we use digitalization in our own factories and it's been compounded uh, by the fact that localization is applied pressure. So uh, we, we had to disrupt ourselves. And, and part of that was studied in a, in a Harvard Business Review where we said, OK, if we can take a lot of these 3D models, these physical models, a lot of these simulations that many of us maybe learned in an engineering school on a green engineering paper with, with calculators and calculus, how can, we, how can we move that into automation, how we can move that into large scale simulations? So really, we can look before we leap. And uh, so we, we looked at one of our facilities in, in Omberg, Germany, and we, we broke it down into really three problem sets or three parts of the challenge. One is what, are, what is the product that we're designing? And we see a, an added complexity to people's interest and company's interest in customization. So we've constantly got to iterate in terms of products that we're providing to the market that we eventually manufacture. And then we move into that realization of creating that digital twin of efficiency. It reminds me a lot of, um, you know, I, I'm sure many people have children that come home and play Minecraft. In a lot of ways, that's a great digital tool. And the next generation is learning how to be a digital twin, right? They're building in a virtual environment. Uh, and so we're, we're trying to build out a lot of what we're doing from a manu manufacturing space in that digital environment and running cycles. And then we'd want that to parlay into optimization and classic OEE. And I think a place where uh, system integrators play a significant role in manufacturing today. And I'm so grateful that we have uh, great partners and integrators that help us in our facilities to do that optimization. And that's moving from the simulated manufacturing environment then into um, how do we automate? How do we automate in, in a good way that makes good business sense for our stakeholders? So that's what we call the comprehensive digital twin. And that's, that's just the way we viewed it from our own facility perspective. And here's an example in, in Omberg where we had a couple of pillars. A lot of them is, uh, you know, we saw better speed, right? When we had more, more products flowing through the facility, we saw more agility. We, we certainly feel quality is an important thing. So we continue to see a, a, a drop in terms of challenges that we have. Um, but, but I think what's kind of um, different here is we, we picked up efficiencies that we never anticipated by using digital tool sets. And we got great, con great, great increases in productivity. And we always had these classic lean measures and, and we still believe in many of those. But when we blend that with the digital twin and robotics and automation, we saw step change. And uh, so we used to have people out there with stopwatches and, and doing very classic industrial engineering uh, scenarios in our manufacturing spaces. And then we armed them with these tools 
which, which again, just allows our, uh, our engineers to be avatars walking through a facility that exists still digitally. And, it, and we found that it's um, far better to make those mistakes in a virtual world and uh, then to take a robot and wreck into arm tooling or uh, to set machinery uh, once it arrives, right? We, we see those startup environments and every vertical being uh, much less blood pressure by practicing before we go and get into the business execution of, of starting capital equipment. Um, we found that some of that reactionary behavior can be quite expensive. So by being proactive in a simulation environment with a lot of the classic lean, um, we're, we're just able to move faster and to make better business decisions. And I think that's going to have a compound effect when uh, localization uh, continues. And here's another example, and I'll, I'll just kind of leave you with this, that you know, if you can take a piece of machinery, even if it's small in scale that has quite a bit of automation, and you can simulate that physically uh, in a virtual environment, you just move down the path, the path faster. And, and hopefully by costing, uh, helping to save some costs as well for your clients. Um, we certainly have seen that in our own facilities. So we embrace the fact that there's been that, that traditional um, ISA 95 stack to integrate a solution or a line or whatever you might have in one of our factories. But we're also trying to use these wonderful tools that exist, right? Edge devices, utilizing the cloud to do analytics and artificial intelligence, trying to make sure you can get to some modularity in production, uh, some plug and play capability. And then again, taking all that rich data set and making wonderful business decisions. But in the end, I really feel integrators um, will play a significant role in, in companies that are localizing and maybe considering digital practices. And um, I always say, you know, when it's your own money and you're out there buying the latest technology, um, whether it's, you know, really cool speakers for your, for your basement and, or a great TV or the, the, the latest and greatest iPhone for your kids, um, it's, it's pretty easy to try and be innovative because those costs are reasonable, let's say in a couple of thousand dollars. But when it's your job and your head count, and it's your budget and, and it's your job on the line, sometimes it's a little unnerving to make that leap of faith and do something more innovative. And as localization causes pressure, I do think that integrators will play a role in encouraging these digital techniques and having organizations using their own money and their own budgets and their own headcount to make that, that leap to being an early adopter or being an innovator with all of these wonderful digital tool sets. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll wrap it up and pass the baton over to, to Alan. Thanks, Chad. Um, as a company, we work closely with Siemens for the reasons that Chad just described. Um, localization is what we're all about. And that means generally getting companies and operations closer to either their supply chains or their customers or both, improving supply chain efficiencies, um, incorporating all of the technology that can help with that, which digitalization is part of it, automation is part of it. And then what's important these days is also incorporating sustainability and ESG principles for any, any company, small or large, um, that's an important criteria. So uh, what Chad just described with digitalization is really a key element because if we, um, if we look at the history of what, what um, happened before localization became an issue as a result of COVID and some other global issues, um, we had the trend of offshoring. And if we go back 40, even 50 years, um, offshoring occurred because companies wanted to save on costs. It was either labor costs, raw material costs, or tax savings. And so um, countries, such as China started to build an ecosystem where they could address those issues. And it actually was a pretty workable system up until really last, last year. It was pretty easy. It did save costs, um, even though manufacturing far away in Asia was a change um, with international steamships and so forth, it was doable. Uh, but what happened really in the last couple of years, it started with tariffs, um, which changed the economic dynamics. And then COVID uh, really opened people's eyes to some of the risks that are inherent in having your operations far away. And, and some of those things were um, when, you're, when you're dependent on only one mode of 
transportation, um, large steamships and um, air cargo is not economically feasible and you're unable to uh, move things as quickly as you'd like to, which still is occurring today, as Chad said, any of us who go shopping or are looking for products realize that uh, like I was in an Ikea store just recently and, and um, that warehouse was almost empty because of supply chain disruption. So what, what happened globally with COVID was it opened a lot of eyes to maybe, maybe uh, offshoring is no longer the best approach or maybe there's some better ways to protect ourselves. So um, on the next slide, I'll just go through some, some definitions. Uh, offshoring, as I said, was just locating an operation far away to save costs. Um, you've heard the term nearshoring. Nearshoring is actually just locating operations to a nearby country. So for example, let's say you're, you're manufacturing in the US, you could set up operations in Canada or Mexico. That's a nearby country. Reshoring is basically reversing what you did in offshoring. So it's transferring a business that was offshored back to its original country. And then close shoring, which is a term our company has coined is really localization. But again, it incorporates uh, technology. It looks very hard at supply chains and also customer satisfaction. So we're all a little bit frustrated. There's some good things that came out of COVID, but there's maybe some not, not so good things. And, and what technology can really do for systems integrators, in addition to helping factories operate more smoothly, I see and we see a larger ecosystem where you could integrate, as Chad said, the beginning, the design, the digitalization, you can test out a factory, you can assist integration of production, but then afterwards, what about supply chains? What about delivery of products to customers and, and ensuring that your products get to your customers quickly? And on the reverse, if you have raw materials coming in, using digitalization, using system integration to know where every single component is in the process, where it's coming from, when it will arrive, so you can plug it right into your manufacturing process. That leads to efficiencies. And really, in order for localization to start to become a trend, um, we need all these other advantages because if, if you look at offshoring, there still are cost savings with labor if you go offshore, but you can balance that out with a combination of technologies, government support, and other factors that really level the playing field. Um, so why, why should companies localize on the next slide? Um, really it's take, take control of your supply chain, um, improve responsiveness and customer satisfaction, um, create this ecosystem that looks at more than just manufacturing, avoid the next COVID or, or the next geopolitical risk. Now that our eyes have been opened, unfortunately, it's predictable there are going to be ongoing disruptions. So how do you protect against that? If you can uh, add to your operations with a factory, let's say in North America, maybe leverage off some cost savings in Mexico, integrate that whole process, then you're competitive with Asia. And um, again, ESG is important. I want to, want to uh, explain why, you know, carbon reduction, everybody is tuned into that. Um, it is important to figure out how you can use more advanced energy. Um, that as a part of this whole collective approach gives you competitive advantages over some of the um, international options. And then communities, what's, what's more important than benefiting local communities, creating jobs, uh, creating the jobs of the future. We, we focus on what we call industries of the future. And there is a great opportunity to create new skill sets, new jobs that don't require two year or four, four year degrees. They can 
these certifications. It can happen in six months, a year or less. So that's a way for both young people and workers in industries that let's say are evolving. Some of the traditional energy industries are going away because of ESG, but those workers still need jobs. How can you retrain these people that already have great skills into different skills that support um, localization in industries of the future? So um, for example, uh, everybody says, well, automation and robots will replace humans, but that's really not the truth. What, what robots are good at are doing dangerous, repetitive type processes that really you know, are too risky for humans. But for every robot, you're gonna need a human somewhere, either making sure that the robots work, programming. So the jobs are really just a transition. And, and there's estimates of 15 million to 20 million jobs in, in the new economy just related to incorporating technology. So my opinion is we, we will actually see an increase in jobs. The key though is training, reskilling and um, government support both federally and locally. And Harrison will talk a little bit about um, governments, but as I see it, it's a, it's a real advantage to be able to move toward localization. And we're, we're at the early stages, but I'll, I'll remind everybody when China uh, started their move toward attracting businesses to local, uh, localize manufacturing in China, it actually took them more than 10 years to build up the ecosystem. Once it was built up and where it is today, it's very advantageous, but it takes time. You can't just flip a switch to um, have everybody localize in one place or another, but it does seem to us that that mitigates risks. And, and where we see things going, talking to uh, corporate executives, and there've been a number of surveys done, what we believe will happen is companies, at least public companies that were utilizing their profits to buy back stock will start taking some of those profits and deploying that as capital improvements because it is expensive to set up a new factory depending on size and scope and, and other factors. You know, you're looking at a billion dollars or more for large operations, but the money is there in terms of corporate profits. It's just a matter of how do you wanna deploy those profits? And in the long run, I know that CEOs and CFOs have done the math and they realize taking some of those profits and putting them toward new factories, toward localization actually will pay off in the long run. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about some of, uh, some of the trends that we're seeing that gives us an indication that this localization is starting to happen. Um, TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation is the largest chip maker in the world based out of Taiwan. Um, they're building a new factory in Arizona. Uh, there are expectations that they'll build more than one factory in North America. Uh, Samsung, South Korean company already does manufacture chips in the Austin, Texas area. They're more than doubling their capacity there. And uh, the, the federal government is creating some incentives for companies like Intel, TSMC, and Samsung to address this issue because um, chips, lithium ion batteries, rare earth minerals, those are actually a national security risk that uh, the US has kind of fallen asleep on. But just in recent weeks, seems that there is strong bipartisan support for addressing that issue. And uh, the Senate just passed a $250 billion bill to specifically address four areas related to that. Um, SK is a South Korean company in the process of building a lithium ion battery factory in Georgia to support electric vehicles. And then uh, Peloton, who currently manufactures all of their products in Taiwan, will be building a US factory in Ohio, um, employing about 2000 people. They'll still rely on Taiwan, but 
going consistent with the theme of localization, they will have a factory in the United States. And then Polestar is basically the EV arm of Volvo, which is owned by a Chinese company named Geely. Polestar um, is going to build a dedicated EV factory in South Carolina where Volvo manufactures. One, one other comment that I'll make about localization. We've kind of seen this movie before and, and it's worked. We've seen it in traditional energy where uh, the US was dependent on oil imports and then addressed that issue and ramped up production of domestic uh, fossil fuel. Now that that's um, going away because of ESG, but that successfully happened. And then the automobile industry is a great example. Every major automobile manufacturer with the exception of Jaguar Land Rover has set up manufacturing and assembly in North America, either in the United States and or Mexico. So we know that the localization ecosystem can be done because it's been done before. Um, I'll, I'll close with trends that I see from systems integrators. Again, I see it beyond just the factory. I see it as um, materials. How do they get to the factory where you can integrate all kinds of logic and technology? How does the factory operate most efficiency, efficiently with people and machines integrating together? How do you transport your finished products to customers? as quickly as possible? And then how do you get some feedback on how your customers are um, seeing the products that you deliver to them? Every step of that way, there's an opportunity for systems integration. So I see a huge ecosystem opportunity for the industry. And I think it's, it's inevitable. And, and in a sense, we almost have a crystal ball. It's not if, it's just when and how long it will take. It will take I believe five to 10 years to fully ramp it up, but it's in motion. So thank you very much. And I'll flip it to uh, Harrison at this time. Harrison Wadsworth is with Siemens and based in Washington, DC. Sure, well, well thanks Alan and, uh, and good morning everyone. And thanks for the opportunity to, to share our perspective here. Um, you know, let me start out with a quote that I think sums up the topic well, uh, quote from for one of a nail, the shoe was lost. For one of a shoe, the horse was lost. For one of a horse, the rider was lost. For one of a rider, the battle was lost. And for one of a battle, the kingdom was lost. And all for the one of a horseshoe nail. You might recognize that old proverb. President Biden invoked that when unveiling an executive order earlier this year that put in motion a whole of government effort to work with the private sector to onshore critical supply chains to the United States. Let me give you a little more context with some additional statements. Uh, Quote, more secure and resilient supply chains are essential for our national security, our economic security, and our technological leadership. Uh, that statement comes from National Economic Council Director Brian Deese and National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan in the report on the initial findings of the study of four important supply chains. And don't worry, this is not gonna be a sermon, but let me give you two more statements from leaders who are quoted together. Uh, quote, I've worked with my colleagues to ensure our bill will help invest in innovative small businesses that create jobs, invest in critical emerging technologies, and put America in a position to outgrow, out-innovate, and out-compete China. And that was from Senator Todd Young, a Republican uh, of Indiana, a very conservative member of the Senate. Last one, quote, this legislation will enhance American competitiveness with China and other countries by investing in American innovation creating good paying American manufacturing and high tech jobs and strengthening America's research and development capabilities. Our bill is key to preserving America's position on the world stage as a current and future technological leader of the 21st century. That was Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, a Democrat from New York. They were talking about the same bill. They did it together. So there you have it. You have leaders from across our government at the highest level laying out the challenge. So I think, you know, at a, at a time when it seems like there's so much political divisiveness and it seems like our two political parties couldn't agree on the recipe for ice cubes, there's actually little daylight between them on the conclusion that it's time to start developing an American industrial policy to ensure that our country can have a secure economy in the future. So up on the screen here, you'll see, you know, an overall state of play of the major industrial and infrastructure investments and initiatives that the US government is considering, mostly on a bipartisan basis. And I'm not going to speak to all this, but I thought seeing it as a reference might be helpful. And if you, you know, if you just follow the news media, which has a, really a business imperative to emphasize conflict, you, you probably wouldn't realize that there's actually general agreement on this topic. 
I'm sure there's some differences on the exact approach and how much money to spend, but the fact that they agree on the challenge is huge and the fact that they're working together on legislation is much more important. Uh, let me get into a couple specifics. Uh, since coming into office in January, President Biden has been extremely focused on addressing the COVID-19 pandemic. And now economies are reopening and Americans are emerging from the pandemic with a new appreciation for our place in the world. Uh, that, that is a world where we don't make a lot of our critical supplies in this country. Uh, earlier this year, I watched a hearing where Senate Finance Committee Chairman, a Democrat from Oregon, opened his committee's hearing on trade and supply chain security with the announcement that they were meeting to solve the great toilet paper crisis of March 2020. Remember that? It's kind of a funny line, but it's a serious point. Uh, you know, Alan and Chad mentioned this, you know, try to buy a car or a lawnmower or lumber to fix your back deck right now. You're going to have trouble. Uh, so people are getting it at the consumer level and that trickles up to Washington quickly. And it's not a simple task. Our nation really hasn't had an industrial policy per se since World War II in the early stages of the Cold War. But if you think back to those days, what did the U.S. do? We implemented the Defense Production Act to compel companies to produce wartime materials. And the same thing happened last year when companies were ordered to produce medical supplies. Siemens helped some of those companies respond uh, to the call by leveraging design and simulation, digital twins of the product and production process to achieve speed, efficiency, and scale unthinkable a decade ago to meet that production challenge at home here. And back in the Cold War days, a Democratic Congress worked with the Republican President Dwight Eisenhower to develop the National Defense Highway System. Today, you know it as the interstate system. Today, President Biden wants to do the same thing for our passenger rail system. Maybe one day you'll know it as the high-speed rail system that connects city pairs with light rail and transit systems in city centers. And the president wants to work with the private sector to build a nationwide network of electric vehicles and charging systems powered by renewable energy stored in advanced batteries. And you know, fortunately, Siemens is pretty well positioned to build all of the systems here in the US and help other companies do the same. So in response to crises in the 20th century, we built up our industry and built up our infrastructure. We also built and strengthened our international alliances, and that's what's on the table today, too. Uh, but of course, there's now an existential threat facing us in the form of uh, carbon and climate change and social issues that have to be addressed to build a more cohesive and, and unified nation. So the government is focusing uh, on using its investments in infrastructure and industry to rebuild the economy in a smarter, cleaner way uh, to address the effects of climate change and build a more inclusive economy. Go back. Go, I'm still on the, the first one. Uh, the only problem is we don't make very many of those nails, to borrow Biden's metaphor. And so that's why the definition of infrastructure is being brought in to include manufacturing and the tools that are needed to make this stuff. So a few weeks ago, the Biden administration released its initial findings after a 100-day review of supply chain security for semiconductors and advanced packaging, large capacity batteries, critical minerals and materials, and pharmaceuticals and active pharma ingredients. And they announced that they're on track to release more findings on sector-wide studies of supply chains for transportation, national defense, telecom, energy, and uh, biological preparedness uh, early next year. So now I wanna share what the president has proposed to do about this and where I think the Congress is willing to work with them. If you go to the next one. Um, here's how the Biden administration's focus on COVID recovery, infrastructure development, and boosting manufacturing is playing out on the ground. Uh, on March 11th, the Congress passed and President Biden signed the American Rescue Plan, almost $2 trillion for COVID relief, and included billions for medical supply manufacturing and small business credit support and helping transport, transportation providers get back on track. And if you're following these opportunities, I'd encourage you to visit the Treasury Department's landing page on the, on the program to find out how the funds are being distributed and how to capture opportunities. Uh, if you just search for you know, Treasury Department American Rescue Plan, it'll be the first thing that comes up. Um, I mentioned the executive order in the report that came out uh, covering semiconductors, minerals, batteries, and pharma. And now the administration and the Congress are looking to operationalize some of those findings. The work on semiconductors was already underway. If you go back to last year when chip shortages and security concerns came to focus as a result of the pandemic, they started really thinking about it and what the right solution set would be. And that led to the Congress passing the Chips for America Act as part of the 2021 uh, defense authorization law. It authorized $10 billion to help stand up more domestic semiconductor manufacturing, especially for newer chip models. And it turns out that was just the start. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, Alan mentioned this, the Senate approved on a, a very strong bipartisan vote, the U.S. Innovation and Competitiveness Act, which is a bill to invest in industries of the future, added $52 billion in support for semiconductor manufacturing. And it's now going over to the House where it seems like there's interest in taking it up and getting it over to the president to become law. 
So what about the other verticals and industrial sectors? Well, there's a lot of discussion in Congress about providing new investment tax credits, direct subsidies, or other incentives for capital improvements in manufacturing plants. A lot of this is summed up in what President Biden calls the American Jobs Plan, which calls for $400 billion in manufacturing and workforce development. And actually just this morning, I read some reports that the administration is actually gonna start using the term industrial policy publicly. So let me share what, what's in that plan. We go to the next one. Um, so this American Jobs Plan, sometimes you hear it referred to as the Biden Infrastructure Plan, outlines a very broad definition of infrastructure that includes manufacturing, not just semiconductor and other acute shortages that we know about right now, but developing a true government-backed industrial policy uh, with funding for all sorts of industrial development programs in partnership with private companies. Semiconductor, supply chain research and security programs, clean energy, innovation hubs, growing the eligibility of the tax credit that maybe some of you and your partners use to lower the cost of purchasing advanced manufacturing tools used in the clean energy development sector, uh, maybe make that, making that more broadly applicable to other industries. And it outlines 100 billion for workforce development. Uh, now keep in mind, this is the big picture plan that comes out of the White House, and now it's up to the Congress to do something to make it real. So I wanna illustrate now how that's working in practice. If you can go to the, the next slide. So those quotes I mentioned at the top from the Republican and Democratic senators are referencing this bill, the U.S. Innovation and Competitiveness Act. And I mentioned it, it just passed a couple weeks ago, 68 to 32. You don't see 68 to 32 votes in the modern Congress. Um, it authorizes $242 billion in investments over five years and focused on areas of emerging technologies. If you look at that sidebar there, those are the, the fields of focus. Um, and the fact that it's bipartisan means it has durability. It has a good chance of making it through the House and to the president for signature by the end of the year. And the goal, again, is to develop American industry and research to outcompete China and in industries of today and the future. And it's meaningful for advanced manufacturers and those like us who are focused on the onshoring opportunity uh, beyond these specific technologies and verticals, because the research and development components are aimed to develop U.S. industry at large. So there's specific programs dedicated to fast tracking research into reality and uh, when, when promising results are discovered. And the fact that it included $52 billion in emergency make it available right now money for semiconductors, um, that's because that was already a matter of public debate, debate over the last congressional cycle. And I think that's telling. I put red boxes on some of those slides so you could follow the, the thread here where semi was already on the table last year and now the money becomes available this year. So I think if you could look at what's happening in that industry as a guide for what's gonna happen with the other three major sectors of focus, battery, minerals, and pharma. If you go to the, the last one there, um, I just wanna close by showing what, what's my crystal ball and the way I think about politics and legislation and how this nascent industrial policy is coming together. You know, when evaluating government of activity, you gotta remember that there's, there's really two interrelated tracks. You've got the political track where the politicians communicate to voters and how they position themselves relative to one another. And then you've got the legislative and regulatory track, the actual functioning of government. In the first quarter, the Democrats came out with somewhat of an election mandate. They got their $2 trillion in COVID relief through the Congress, and uh, they got to work on that competitiveness bill with the Republicans. Now they're trying to get infrastructure done. And President Biden issued a, a series of his executive orders related to supply chains, cybersecurity, Buy America, and, and other matters. And now in the second quarter, those initiatives are moving through the legislative process. You're starting to see politicians claiming political victory at home. So in, in August, the Congress will take a break to go to their home states and talk about what they've done and what's next. And during this time, there's actually an important deadline uh, to be aware of for where uh, states have to certify to the Treasury Department how they're going to spend that two trillion dollars that they got. Um, so if you want to help try to capture some of that or work with partners to do it, now's the time to get your ideas on the table. Um, in September and October, I think we're going to see more legislative activity. Maybe that competitiveness bill makes it through the process and that 52 billion becomes immediately available, basically. And I think there's a good chance infrastructure gets done too. And then by December, there's gonna be a rush to complete work by the end of the year. And that's when I think uh, you'll see some, um, uh, what's really possible politically and legislatively. And I think infrastructure, manufacturing incentives and industrial policy to include some tax policy changes could all to come together at the end of the year. So if you're looking for your opportunity, I recommend tracking these initiatives and starting to talk to your partners and customers about how you'll help them capture opportunities in your vertical markets of focus. You know, generally government money, uh, when they become available from Congress, they take a few months to flow. 
So if they get this done by the end of the year, by next spring, I think you'll see a lot of the funding of those incentives uh, on the street and ready to be put to work. So thanks, thanks for the opportunity to participate today and I can take any questions or contribute to the discussion. And Harrison, I just wanted to kind of wrap it up from at least a Siemens sponsorship standpoint. First of all, we're honored to have the, the chance to speak to this group. And I do want to reiterate the, the point that, um, you know, systems integrators and solution providers uh, throughout the United States, they are the unsung heroes. They are the ones that are the glue that, that, that brings a lot of manufacturers together with machine builders and, and really helps manufacturers gain those productivities they, they need to have a competitive edge. Um, so I just really wanted to, to say from the Siemens perspective, thank you for allowing us to speak. Um, our hope was to try and bring three topics um, to the table. One is that digitalization probably will play a role in localization, like localization is real. And uh, we're starting to see a lot of companies move in this direction. And then to offer some insight in terms of what our team in Washington, D.C. is watching unfold. And, and how do you connect uh, the work of, of the government and these budgets together with localization movements in your own state of operation, or maybe you operate domestically in the U.S.? And then how do you use some of these wonderful tool sets? Siemens provides them, but there's lots of other great manufacturers that are doing things to help this cause. And I think it's going to take all of us to be uh, successful in this localization movement. So. Um, with that, I just wanted to say thank you. And again, the, the, the three uh, speakers here were more than happy to answer a few questions here and there. Hi, Chad, this is Andrew. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, just had a question. Um, a, a lot of great information today, and I appreciate it. Question about how the money would flow, and it may be a question for Harrison. Um, you talked a lot about the federal government, but then mentioned the state government as well. Will this be federal funds that end users are looking to obtain to increase their manufacturing capabilities, or is this state money? How would they go about acquiring the money for projects? Yeah, great, great question. So the, the money that was made available back in March flows directly to the state governments, and they've actually got a really broad flexibility for how to how to use that money. So um, it's really up to the state. A lot of them are going to distribute it to counties or uh, or city governments, and then you know or, or universities. But generally, it's got to flow through a public institution. Um, with the, with the Chips Act and and that money. Um, it's, it's, it can be a combination of both, but generally it's going to have to go through some kind of P3 type of public-private partnership type of setup or, or university or industry consortium. Um, there's, there's a lot of discussion about having more of the money flow through the manufacturing USA institutes. Um, so generally it's not going to go directly to a private company. Um, that's for the direct grants, but for these tax incentives, which you know can lower the cost of, of doing business in our sector, that that generally would be a you know a, a, a refundable tax credit that, that you claim on your taxes at the end of the year. So in that instance, it sort of just goes directly to the company. Got it. Thanks, Harrison. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Our system integration community has not been very active in advocacy efforts. And um, my question to you, Harrison, do you think that the times are calling for us to play a bigger role in advocacy to make sure that, you know, we are an active player in this, in this solution for this uh, modernization of the U.S. manufacturing? I think so. You know, my, I mean, I, I do this for a living, so that's, that's obviously I think that, but I always say if you don't get in the kitchen, you end up on the menu. And when I go in and I tell members of Congress that advanced manufacturing is the way to lower cost parameters to make a business case for, for onshoring or localizing manufacturing, it, with a lot of them, it's like the first time anybody's ever told them that. You know, there, there's other members of Congress that have been in an industry and stuff and kind of get it, but, but when I say, you know, we can put technology into these factories that lower the cost parameters and make it so you're, you're closer to the customer and it'll make companies want to able to able to have a business case to do business here. They're like, wait, what? Really? I thought we could never do that. You know, so I think now is definitely the time to get in the game. Thank you. And the other follow-up question is for all of us um, to be 
you just asked us to to keep tracking this to to see how it evolves into the particular verticals that our system integration members are playing etc um, we all know that right now there's a lot of political color from from both sides what do you recommend for for our members to be tracking is it like make sure you track from both sides and take the average or like what do you think would be good sources for for our members to be tracking to to stay in, informed yeah I, I would say don't don't track the process because the process doesn't necessarily matter in the end Tr track the results so pay attention to what the president actually signs into law um, you know pe people like me do that for a living and, and it, you know it makes my head spin trying to figure out you know who's doing what and what's going to be in the final bill it takes it's you know they say it's like making sausage right so it takes a while and then you see what you get in the end um, so pay attention to what the president signs and the, and the announcements that come out of the white house on, on what's becoming law and then when you when you see something become law look at which federal department is getting the money because then the instructions on how to capture the money will end up on their website in a few weeks so uh, with the chips act a lot of the money is going to flow through the commerce department for example so that um, when that money becomes available go on the commerce department's website they're going to want to get the money out in industry rapidly so they're going to make it easy to, to figure out how to get it thank you there's Miss andrew again and in a follow-up to uh jose's question uh about getting involved in advocacy where would you say you know there's a lot of our integrator community ranges from smaller companies to larger companies and everything in between how would you advise like that first step is it as easy as calling your congressman setting up a meeting you know where is a starting point um yeah a lot of times it is best you know to, to start with your your home member of congress whoever represents you and and they can actually help make some connections that their, their, their staff on their team um you can work with i don't know if you're members of any of the you know trade groups like the national association of manufacturers or other groups like that they've all got advocacy tools um, but sometimes just, just calling and knocking on the door, um, is a good place to start. Um, I mean, I used to work for a member of Congress and when a manufacturer in our district contacted our office, we, we took the meeting every time. So. We are close to the, we're part of the automation federation, which is a group of, you know, entities related to, to automation. And so this has been our closest to advocacy, um, leveraging their infrastructure. So. So maybe it's time to, to revisit. Okay. So it looks like we are done with the question. So I really want to, now I want to put my finishing slides. See if I can do this. So on behalf of CSA, I would like to, to thank Chad, Allen and Harrison for this informative discussion. I, also would like to thank Siemens for sponsoring this event. And of course, thank all of you who attended. Um, I really thought this was a very good event. It is one that forces us system integrator community to take the bigger picture of what's happening in the, on the government uh, space, which has a lot of implications for, for our businesses. So I would like to remind those who attended that there will be a recording that will be available for viewing within the next couple of days. Please visit our CSI website to view past virtual events you may have missed. And please remember that we have a full calendar of weekly events. Um, please sign up on our website on the events calendar. And um, if you have other issues, questions, um, please don't hesitate to contact Lisa Richter, our industry director, or myself, the CEO of CSA. We welcome your input and and thanks again this was an excellent event i'm very glad that i was the host of it i really liked it thank you very much thank you thank you thanks Jose.